Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. Our guest today is Stephen Long, and we'll be talking about his book, Saving Carl Bart. Steve, thanks so much for being a part of today's episode of Fortress Press Live. Sean, thanks a lot. It's a, it's a delight to speak with you and to speak about my book, Saving Carl Bart, that Fortress Press has published. Well, Steve, why don't you take a few minutes, uh, introduce yourself to the Fortress Press Live audience, and tell us about your teaching role over there at Marquette University. Oh, very good. I am professor of systematic theology at Marquette University. I teach in the theology department. I primarily teach undergrad and doctoral students. Prior to that, I taught at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary on the campus of Northwestern University, and prior to that at St. Joseph's University. So this is my, which was also a Jesuit institution. This is my second time working with the Jesuits, even though I am a Methodist and an ordained elder in the Methodist Church. Well, thanks for giving us a, a little bit of your background and, and telling us about where you teach. It's always very helpful to get that on the front end of an interview. And as you mentioned, today we're going to be talking about your book called Saving Carl Bart. Now, every book has a, a, a bit of a unique backstory. And as I was looking through the book today, I noticed that you went into this some um, in the introductory part of the book. So. Give us some insight into how this book got its start. I do explain it a bit in the introduction. This book is really a, it has sort of been with me since my graduate school days at Duke University back in the early 90s, late 80s. I was honored to be part of a very ecumenical doctoral program. We had Catholics and Protestants and we had a number of reading groups. Uh, a number of us were reading Karl Barth on a regular basis, and a number of us were reading Hans Urs von Balthasar. So we had Catholics and Protestants reading both and having conversations about uh, what it meant for Barth and Balthasar to do theology and the unique ways in which they were doing theology. And Barth and Balthasar have always been companions in my work in almost everything I've done. I've, I consult them and, and uh, look to them. And I've always been intrigued by their friendship. I think it was interesting that prior to Vatican II, at a time in Switzerland, when it was still illegal for Jesuits, and Balthazar was a Jesuit when he first met Karl Barth, it was illegal for Jesuits to teach or preach in school or church that they had this friendship uh, and this uh, remarkable friendship between the two of them. And I wanted to trace that down. And I had the opportunity to do that eventually. I, I taught a course on Bart and Balthazar, both at Garrett and at Marquette. So I've taken students through their work and sort of always worked on this book. And a few years ago, decided I really want to get this book finished. A second reason for the book has to do with my concerns about certain directions in contemporary theology. In one sense, what Balthazar and Bart overcame, I thought, in theology seems to be returning, a staunch neo-Thomism in Catholicism in the kind of modern liberal Protestantism. And uh, what I find interesting in Balthazar and Barth's work is that they both, from very different perspectives, challenged long-seated trajectories that they had inherited. And now I saw those returning, so I thought it was an important time to revisit not only the friendship and the history between Balthazar and Barth, but also the significance of their theology. Thank you for that uh, additional background. I think that gives us some helpful insight into why and some of the ground that you're going to cover in the book. Now, Saving Carl Bart covers a, a lot of wonderful insights that we haven't necessarily seen before in English. Uh, I'd be curious to hear a bit about what kind of archival work you did uh, as you researched and prepared the book, and, and what are some of your favorite discoveries from that research? I was... Delighted to receive a grant from the Swiss National Fund, which allowed me to spend a month in Basel doing research in the archives, both the BART archives and the Balthazar archives. The Balthazar archives are not officially open yet, but I was able to get into both of the archives. They're only about a couple miles apart, and yet, unfortunately, there's not a lot of movement between them. People either come to study one or the other. In, in fact, when I spoke to some of the Protestants about my research, they didn't even know that there was a Balthazar archive. Um, and it, it's also the case that um, the Bart and Balthazar archives are separated by a rather significant hill. And since I'm an avid cyclist, I took my bike with me and made that trek 
quite often on my bicycle, which was a lot of work. I was able to read, before I went to Basel, Manfred Lachbrunner's really important work. He did a lot of archival work in both the Balthazar and Bart archives, and I'm really indebted to his work. And he published the letters between Balthazar and Bart in German. So I was able to read those letters, and from those letters, determine what I needed to do in the brief time I was in Basel. So I knew bits about the history between them. I knew about Balthazar's leaving the Jesuits in 1950, and the ultimatum that was given him, either he had to choose the Jesuits or this new community that he had started, which became known as the Johannes Gemeinschaft, the community of St. John, which is still there today and preserves his, his archives. Balthazar felt a strong vocation to choose that a lay institute, even though it cost him his vocation as a Jesuit. And so I was able to both read about that in the archives and speak with people who knew him, including Peter Enrici, his nephew, and that was in his secretary, Claudia Koppel. Ms. Ms. Koppel was very helpful to me. I didn't realize the trouble he had gotten into because a wealthy family, uh, his daughter, had joined this lay institute and had taken a vow of celibacy and poverty, and they were very unhappy about it and wanted to know what standing this lay institute had in the church. And the local bishop, whose name was Strang, which means strict in English, aptly so named, decided that it had no standing, but as long as Balthazar was a Jesuit, he couldn't touch it. So when Balthazar left the Jesuits, Balthazar was actually banished, not only from his work in the Johannine community, but he had to leave Basel. He was not allowed to live in the city. That's the kind of power the local bishop had over him. And for six years, he had an irregular status with the Catholic Church. And during that time, he was still writing Karl Barth. They were communicating. I also was intrigued by the lectures Balthazar gave on Karl Barth, which were very controversial in the 1940s. He gave 10 lectures, and those lectures stemmed from the first book. Balthazar wrote a book on the theology of Karl Barth, that's the English translation. That book was written and presented to Barth in 1941, but it was not allowed to be published for a decade because of the censors. And very few people knew the history of that. I was able to find out quite a bit about that, even read the reports of the censors, which were intriguing. But Balthazar never mentioned this in the book. He never, there's one opaque reference to it. And then another curious thing for me was tracing down the relationship between Karl Barth and his publicist, Arthur Fry. Arthur Fry was a staunch defender of the Jesuit prohibition in Switzerland, one of the staunchest defenders of it. He wanted it enforced, this silencing of Jesuits. And uh, he, was, he was Karl Barth's not only publicist, but one of his closest friends. And so when Balthazar was giving his lectures on Barth in Basel, this was quite controversial. And the letters between Barth and Fry uh, are intriguing about whether or not they should... Uh, Fry tried to intervene, and, and Barth basically told him not to, said this is important. So those historical aspects of the relationship, the difficulties... Their friendship had to overcome, and it's significant, I think, for opening up a rapport between Protestants and Catholics. The reason I called the book Saving Karl Barth is because Hans Urs von Balthasar was well known for high-profile conversions from Protestantism to Catholicism. And he had to have on his mind that if he could convert Barth to Catholicism, that was the holy grail. Uh, and clearly, that uh, in, was one of the reasons he initiated their friendship. But in the process, and because Bart was really staunchly reformed, Balthazar staunchly Catholic, in the process of a real honest give and take, they became friends, and I think they learned a great deal from each other. Interesting follow-up question. In, in preparing this work, I, I'm curious if you had any surprises or insights about Balthazar and, and his theology, uh, either that surfaced for you as you were doing your research or that were at least new to you. I did. One of the, the real insights for me was to get a better sense of why Balthazar thought Bart misunderstood 
the debate over the analogia in test, the analogy of being. Anyone familiar with Bart and Balthazar will know that one of the debates, one of the ongoing debates that we continue to have, even now, there was a conference a few years ago on this at, uh, I believe it was Catholic University, um, it might have been the Dominican House, and there's been ongoing conferences about it at Princeton, was did Bart understand the analogia entus, the analogy of being? Now, the reason that matters is because Bart had invited Eric Chavara, who was one of Balthazar's mentors, to lecture in his class back in the 1920s. And uh, Chavara had written a book called Analogy Interest, the Analogy of Being, and made it the heart and center of Catholic theology. When Bart was accused by one of his colleagues, Georg Waberman, of being responsible for two conversions to Catholicism, Bart responded by saying, they did not convert because of me. They converted despite me. And it was out of that, that kind of heated exchange. It was very, if you can imagine, there were public editorials about this back in the 30s. This, you know, it's still theology really mattered at that time in Basel. It unfortunately does not have that power today. But it really mattered. These were public editorials. Who was responsible for these two conversions? Georg Faberman saying it's Bart's dogmatic theology. If you start with, if you do theology dogmatically, you'll wind up at Rome. And Faberman said, you know, we, we need to return to Schleiermacher and the the genius of our, our liberal Protestantism, and Bart would have nothing to do with that. He refused to admit that his theology led to Rome. And so when Eric Peterson, one of these two high-profile Protestants who did convert to Catholicism, when he converted, he said, no, it wasn't because of my theology, it was despite my theology. And in turn, in that, in that context, Bart made his opaque critique of Catholicism which is found in the introduction to Dogmatics 1.1, that the analogia entus is the invention of the Antichrist and a reason never to become Roman Catholic. Now, Bart never actually explained in full what he meant by this, but it was quite provocative, and it still is to this day. If Chavara says the analogia entus is the heart of Roman Catholicism, and Bart says, no, it's the Antichrist, and the reason you should never become Roman Catholic, really, I think, in response to Waberman's very public denunciation of Bart. Then Balthazar arrives in 1939, having just worked with Chavara in Munich. He arrives and wants to have a conversation with Bart about this analogiandus. And what I was intrigued, and I did not know this before I went to Basel, before I did some reading that I hadn't done, especially in Balthazar's large three-volume apocalypse book, which is only in German. Balthazar at several points said, Bart is right. There's something not quite right about contemporary Roman Catholic theology. But he's misidentified the error. The error is not the analogia entis. The error is a doctrine of pure nature. A doctrine of pure nature which for Balthazar was a kind of invention in 18th century a Catholic theology, particularly Neotomism. And he said that in a couple places, and I, I didn't realize that before I went, but I find that really intriguing. Bart was Balthazar Sr. He was older than Balthazar, and I'm not sure he ever really heard that critique by Balthazar. But for me, that was a really important insight. Another insight that I came away from was Balthazar is usually not considered a moral theologian. I, I mean by that I mean, he's a moral theologian. There was, <laughs> there was nothing in Balthazar's character that suggests that there was any uh, moral improprieties, but he's not viewed as a Christian ethicist, per se. And uh, in trying to think about the relationship between Bart and Balthazar and theology and ethics, it struck me how much he'd been influenced by Bart. To reread the moral life, the ethical life, in terms of Christian dogmatics, I think that's really important. I think that's made a huge difference in a number of uh, Catholic moral theologians. Well, in the next question, you've already covered a bit of this ground already in the interview, but for the benefit of listeners who are only minimally familiar with either Bart or Balthazar, give us a brief kind of snapshot of who these men were and anything else you'd like to comment on about what was really unique or, or important for us to know about their friendship. Well, they were both Swiss, and Balthazar 
I lived most of his life in Switzerland, as, as did Bart. Most people know the story of Bart. He was in Germany. The Nazis came to power. He was forced to leave Germany, return to, to Basel. He was given a teaching position at the University of Basel when he left Germany. Um, at one point, Bart wanted to write a letter to all German Christians and tell them to refuse to cooperate with Hitler's army. And his publicist, Archer Fry, convinced him that was not a good idea. His books were already banned in Germany. This was not an easy time. This was a difficult time. Bart had joined a group called the National Widerstand, the uh, uh, National Opposition. And Bart said he would take up arms against the Nazis if they invaded Switzerland. A lot of people know that he joined what would be the equivalent of what something like our um, uh, military service on, on the weekends and uh, actually stood on the border. You, you can't imagine the Swiss military would have had much of a stand against the Germans, but he did that. He invited von Balthasar to join that group as well. Von Balthasar did not. But was also very, very critical of the Swiss government for what he thought was its neutral stand. And one of the things I discovered in my time there as well was how controversial Bart was with the government, with the political authorities. His phone was tapped. No official, no government official attended his funeral. So Bart and Balthazar were both no strangers to conflict. In fact, you'd have to say, I think they took a certain delight in scandalizing Swiss society. And their friendship did that. And they also had, both of them, very strange relations with women, sometimes inexcusable, and you know, they both had the benefits of patriarchal relations, and I would, I'm not going about to defend that. But Bart, with his assistant, Charlotte von Kirschbaum, and Balthazar with Adrian von Speyer, they would actually go on vacation together on a, on a couple of occasions, and they would go out uh, to a pub and, and discuss things. So, you know, they, they had that kind of a relationship, I think the relationship was also very much in theological. Bart's last public lecture was on Vatican II with Balthazar to the Swiss Ecumenical Agency. That was the last time he spoke in public. So Balthazar and Bart, in one sense, their lives became intertwined. Uh, what also was unique about their friendship was Mozart. I think Mozart brought them together. Balthazar gave a bust of Mozart to Bart, which Bart prominently displayed in his office, and it sits right next to a picture of, of Archer Fry. <laughs> There's a certain irony in that. Likewise, Bart gave to Balthazar a picture of Grunewald's crucifixion, and Grunewald's crucifixion, which can be found at Colmar in France, is, is a beautiful scene from the crucifixion that uh, Bart had over his desk as he did his theology, as John the Baptist pointing to Jesus on the cross with Mary being held by John. It's just powerful. And Balthazar put it above his desk as well. So, you know, I, I do think in many ways, I hope providentially their lives were intertwined and their work was intertwined. I think they're a generation that we'll never have again who could write the volumes that they wrote given all the obligations the religions have today. So um, I think they were also the, the last of a, of a kind of generation. Well, two very fascinating characters. Thanks for that additional information. It really gives a, a lot more meat and context uh, what was going on behind the scenes in those relationships as they were working together and, and writing. Now, thinking about the book, if you had to summarize the main points or, or main problems you strive to address in the book, how would you put those? That's a good question. This book begins with the affirmation that theology should be done in terms of friendship. And the book really does grow out of just a deep, my deep friendships that I've inherited as a theologian uh, over the years. People with whom I've studied, people with whom I've prayed, every theologian should, should also, of course, pray. And in that sense, what one of the key elements of the book is an effort to address the nature of theology theology done as friendship, which is what I think Balthazar and Bart did. And I don't think that friendship here has to be understood as sentimentality. It's certainly not niceness. They were rather 
up front with each other. Their friendship was even strained on occasion because of this. Balthazar rewrote his introduction to his book on Bart and didn't change much and basically said Bart remained obstinate in his position, sent it to him. Bart was recovering from a broken arm. I think he fell off a horse. I don't really remember. And in the letter, Balthazar says, you will not like this. I hope that all that's broken between us is your arm. So you know, so friendship doesn't mean sentimentality. It doesn't just mean niceness. It, but it means having the kind of, you know, you tell the truth with your friends in a way that sometimes you're not willing in other public settings. So there is a, a will to truth here. And I tried to tell that story in the first chapter. I highlighted three things that I thought in that first chapter were really important for their friendship. The first was the doctrine of God. How do we identify a God that we worship? A second was a, a, a Christological focus on ethics. And then a third was the place of the church, the place of the church in the Christian life. On the first two, I think Bart and Balthazar had a great deal of agreement. On the third, I think they had a great deal of disagreement a disagreement of which has not been overcome. And really, you can't say, we, we could never say it's been overcome since we still are divided as a church. But they both felt the pathos of that division. And that's why Balthazar initially wrote his book on Bart. He had read in Bart's dogmatics about what Bart called the enigmatic or puzzling cleft between Protestants and Catholics, which was completely unintelligible. It shouldn't be, and yet there it was. How do we make sense of it? Balthazar begins his book on Bart with that acknowledgement. And I think that acknowledgement was always there in their work. They did not try to paper over that enigmatic cleft, but they tried to really address it, to do something that can be done, recognizing that in the end it's up to God to unify God's church. So the book begins with the history of their friendship, and I tell this story up until about Oh, the mid-1950s. Then the next chapter is a bit polemical. Not that I wanted to be polemical in a book on that tries to situate theology as friendship, but because I thought that following the way Bart and Balthazar had their friendship, it was right to speak, hopefully boldly without being inaccurate, about the way Bart is dismissed by some Catholics these days. Very I mean, brilliant Catholic theologian, and perhaps they dismiss Bart for good reasons. Perhaps they dismiss him because they misunderstand. Perhaps they dismiss him because of his interpreters. So I addressed that aspect of Catholic theology, and then I addressed certain Bardian interpretations that also distance Bart from Balthazar. And want to say that Balthazar never identified what was most important in Bart, and that was that he revised the doctrine of God in some specific ways. And I wanted to argue, and in fact, one of the things that Balthazar found in Bart, found beautiful in Bart, and that was the term he used, Bart's theology is beautiful, was his doctrine of God and how Bart read the perfections of God, God's immutability, eternity, impassibility, God's oneness, God's simplicity, those perfections, how he read them in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity. Balthazar found that intriguing, and he thought that was important. And so at uh, one point, he carries around the dogmatics to one. And Bart said he carries it around like a cat or kitten or something to that effect. I think that's really important work. And it's work I want to continue to build on, in fact. Uh, if I can plug my next work, which with Fortress Press, which I've got in a couple of years, it's a coinless in his legacy. And it's on the simply perfect triune God. I think what Bart and Balthazar saw here was not something new. Neither Bart nor Balthazar thought that being new, being unique, being revisionary was good. Bart said, I am a customary or, or usual traditional theologian, and Balthazar would agree. I think what they saw and what they recovered was the idea that you can't talk about God's unity without at the same time talk about God's trinity, even though in terms of speech that's impossible to do. So how do you try to make that step? And I think the doctrine of God, the Balthas are found in Bart, is just really important. And along with that, and I think it's related, 
and it's related to Balthazar's critique of the doctrine of pure nature, is the claim that ethics is not more universal than theology. I'd have to say in the 18th and 19th century, a great deal of at least Protestant theology. Dogma, doctrine, was viewed as too divisive, but ethics could bring us together. And so there was a focus, even as Gary Dorian described it in his wonderful book, there was uh, the invention of social ethics. It was invented, it was made as a way of bringing together people who disagreed on doctrinal matters. Well, it just didn't work, and Bart recognized it didn't work. And so he interspersed his ethics throughout the dogmatic loci in the church dogmatics. Now, Oliver Donovan has had a raised an important question about that in his most recent book on ethics, but I still think that opens up a new way to think about the tradition of Christian ethics or moral theology. And perhaps it's one which also recovers what Thomas Aquinas tried to do. So again, it's not something new or unique, but it's something which nonetheless shows us how to go on in some very difficult times. Thank you for that helpful summary of the ground that you cover in the book. Now, thinking of using Saving Karl Barth in the classroom, what sorts of either undergraduate or, or graduate classes do you think would benefit from adding the book to their uh, class book list? I would think that any course on 20th century theology would benefit from this book, because its history cannot be told without attention to Bart and Balthazar, either in Catholic or Protestant theology. These are two figures with whom one has to deal even if someone disagrees with him. And there's much to disagree about with Bart and Balthazar. So I would think any course on 20th century theology should attend to their work. And I do think their history of Bart and Balthazar and how it, I mean, it wasn't directly responsible for Vatican II. I would never make that large a claim. But it did, as Balthazar put it in an early work, raise the bastions. It, it tore down some of the fortresses that kept Protestants and Catholics from engaging with each other. So anyone who's interested, any course which is interested, in the divisions of the Church, and why they matter, and how we might begin to address them, I hope could benefit not only from this book, but from thinking about the history and the friendship of Bart and Balthazar and their theology. I think it would be appropriate for a course in the Doctrine of God, as well as a course on Christian ethics. And again, I hope that its ecumenical import is obvious. So I hope it's written at a level that's accessible. One of the reviewers in Christianity Today actually affirmed it for being a narrative theology that actually had a narrative. So I thought that was high praise. I was really happy about that. So I hope it's accessible, and yet at the same time, substantive. So it might be appropriate for both an undergrad and a graduate seminar. That's helpful feedback. Thanks for answering my question. For the listeners who'd like to find out more about Steve's book, you can either take a look at the show notes for this episode, or you can also check out the related product page, which you'll be able to find at our website, which is at fortresspress.com. And Steve, I just wanted to say thanks so much for being generous with your time today and sharing with us about your book, Saving Karl Bart. Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you for the interview, and thanks to Fortress Press for doing such a wonderful job with the book. It really, it really made it beautiful, and a book on Bart and Balthazar should indeed be beautiful. Thanks so much. Thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Stephen Long. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 011. While you're there, be sure to check out other episodes of Fortress Press Live and subscribe to the show via iTunes. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.